all get a hymnal this morning and turn together to hymn number 197. In 197, let's stand together and sing. Come. Good song this morning, isn't it? Good way to start out. Only trust Him, and we need to trust Him. We need Him in our hearts and uh, on our minds and on our thoughts. Uh, we need to cleave to Him, and we we have a need. We have a a longing. We have a uh, something in our heart, something in our mind that. Uh, reaches out for a God that has love and mercy for us, and we need to realize that. We need to admit that this morning. I need Him. I need Him. I only trust Him. I appreciate that. It's good to be in the Lord's house. It's good to be here and see each of you and uh, know that He's still King of the universe, and uh, all the bad news that we've been hearing and seeing and looking at on the, on the radio and on the phone and on the TV, He's still in charge of all that to you. And it's good to be his child this morning and know that he's in charge. And I just wonder if it'd be a prayer request or something you'd like to share this morning for prayer or something, maybe a praise report you'd like to tell about Jesus and what he's done for you. Proverbs chapter 7 this morning. Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 1 says, My son... Keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live in my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. And this week as I was thinking and, and thinking about opening Sunday school and thinking about, well, just the Lord giving me some blessings and thoughts. And a lot of that comes, I've told you before, uh, my work time, <clears throat> I know I'm, I'm working and I'm, I'm usually using my mind somewhat, but lots of times while I'm using my hands, the Lord blesses my heart with thoughts and things that goes on. And, and many times uh, the things I'm doing is things I've done before, so it doesn't take a whole lot of thought maybe, and, and maybe the work shows that, I don't know. But uh, he's blessed me this week thinking about the heart. And uh, I told Pete if I had a title, it would be From the Heart this morning. And I know I don't need a title particularly for opening Sunday school, but 
Uh, he said, bind them upon your fingers, write them upon the tables of thine heart. And I'm thankful this morning that he does that for us. When we get saved and we get uh, in the kingdom of God and we get into fellowship and the brotherhood of Jesus Christ, and he puts his words in our heart. Now, it helps and it does us good to read it. It's not going to be in there much if we don't read it. We, we can hear the preaching and the preacher can read the words and it can be up here. Uh, but we need to read it for ourselves. and We need to get it. But it says the table of thine heart. Now, lots of times we get things and we kind of skim over them and we get kind of the gist of it, but it just stays right up here. And it doesn't move all the way down in here. And, and there's, a, there's things that we can think about that, that illustrates that. Uh, on the road to Emmaus, Brother Chris had a good sermon on that about the heartburn and about how that as they walked and he spoke to them about how that uh, the hearts burned within them and they realized that surely this was the Christ that they were walking and talking with. I tell you what, when you get a hold of the Word of God and you bind it upon your fingers, in other words, everything you do and you touch makes you think about the Word of God and everything that's in your heart is the Word of God. It touches your heart, doesn't it? Old time preachers used to get it right. And our preacher gets it right. He say, I want to tell you what I feel him down in my heart. He gets that gravelly voice sometimes. Down there, the mercy and the grace and all those good things in my heart. Praise God. And that's his heart. He didn't say the things I came in contact this week. I saw on the news, on fake news or on the CNN or all those things. He's talking about what God's blessed him with. I think sometimes about a, when you get company coming or something and you're cleaning the house, maybe this is the way you clean your house all the time, I don't know, but lots of times we'll find a good closet over here that maybe ain't got a whole lot in it and the stuff that's on the couch and the stuff that's on the table and stuff, why don't they bring that in the mail? It all comes in the mail and ends up on my table, ends up on my couch. Why do they do that? Leave that stuff where it's at. But we take it over and we shove it in the closet. Or maybe you got a whole room, you know, we call it the junk room. And we shove stuff in there. That's the extra bedroom at our house, at Marion's house. And if we got company cup in particular, they ain't got no business in that room. They don't need to look in there. So we take stuff and we just shove it in there. Now, if it's a closet, it might get to where there ain't no more room in there, you know. Last time you cleaned up, you ain't cleaned up that mess out of the closet yet. And you keep shoving. Pretty soon when you open the door... You gotta, you gotta kind of watch it. You know, it'll start tumbling out. Well, you know where I'm going. That's kind of like our heart. If we get out in the world and we begin to shove stuff in there and we begin to take stuff in off the internet, off the news, off of the radio, uh, I used to tell my kids, especially my daughter, she loved that country music, and she cut it on in the, on the, in the car when we were going down the road or my truck. And I said, okay. We'll listen to it until they start talking about drinking, and then we're done. I want to switch it back to Joy FM. Oh, Dad, it's okay. And take but half a song usually, and then we click, we're gone. It's gone back over there. The things we put in our hearts, just like that closet, when we get them shoved in there so tight, there ain't no room for the Lord's words in there. There ain't no room for the Lord's mercies in there. There ain't no room for the Lord's love in there for other people. It's all full of junk that we took off the couch or took off the internet or took off the TV. We need his word, just like he said, bind them upon your fingers, write them upon the table to your heart. Let's clean out the old closet, our heart. He said in one place in the word that uh, our hearts were like stone, stony heart, and that his mercies and his love would convert that heart to a heart of flesh, in other words, a soft heart, one that could be uh, molded and, and made by God's love and by his mercy and his grace. Let's clean out the closet of our heart and let's make some room for some more people. Oh, that's kind of scary, isn't it? I got my little circle, my family, my, my friends, my peers. I don't need nobody else. Well, if we're going to be servants of his, we're going to go into the all the regions of the earth and preach and teach his gospel, we've got to have some room for some people in our heart. We've got to have some room for some love for people and some love for their everlasting soul in our heart. We ain't got room for last week's mail. 
we ain't got room for all the stuff on the internet. And man, it's all on there. Isn't it? But bind them upon your fingers and write them on the tables of your heart. This morning, let's, let's allow room for the words of the Savior. Let's allow room for His love. Let's allow room for His mercy and His grace. That's what's on my heart this morning. But Ron, would you dismiss us this morning? We are taught over a lesson, share Christ with your neighbor. You know, in our, in our last uh, few lessons, they were all about uh, loving, loving our neighbor. And we can show love by helping them with what they may need. Uh, it may be a financial need or it may just be spending some time with them and, and just, or just talking with them. You know, people can have all different kinds of needs. But the greatest need and most important need that everyone needs, everyone needs Christ in their life. That's the greatest and most important. So the greatest love that we can show someone that is lost is telling them about Jesus. You know, inviting them to know Christ, that's the greatest thing that we can do for anybody. You know, the point of our lesson is that we love our neighbors when we tell them about Jesus. You know, in our lesson, we will see how the disciples told each other about Jesus before they ever became disciples, Jesus' disciples. You know, when I was the, when I was the EMS director, I hired many people. I don't know how many, but I know it was well over a hundred people that I hired during my tender there. You know, some are still there, but others, they've found different jobs. But before I would hire them, I would put them through an interview process. They would have to demonstrate different skills, like what drugs to give for different scenarios. And the thing is, it was actually what we put them through, it was actually very difficult and could be overwhelming. It was overwhelming for some of them. The reason, though, I did this was to find the best candidate for the job. I always looked at it as they may be working on me someday or my family or friends and so forth. You know, I wanted to hire the best. You know, there were times, though, that I wouldn't hire any of the candidates. But back in the first century, the rabbi would select a few young men to be his pupils. You know, he would, he would, uh, he would weed out the ones and he would keep the best to teach. You know, and it was also as a high honor just to be selected to be a candidate. But how did Jesus pick his disciples? It sure wasn't the same way that I chose an employee or the way the rabbi chose a student. Jesus chose the least likely candidate to be a disciple, as far as we knew. I guess that just shows how, how much I know, because Jesus knew what he was doing. Anyway, we'll get started in our lesson, verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. John was the one that wrote this gospel. And John gives the reason why he's writing this uh, gospel. He, he says the reason in chapter 20, verse 31. He said, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have faith through his name. John wanted people. He wanted people to know about Jesus and let them know that Jesus, yes, he was the Messiah. He also wanted to tell that Jesus existed before, the, before his birth here on earth. Now, John the Baptist, he had been preaching and telling everyone that would listen that the Messiah, he was coming. The disciples, they had also, they heard, that John, heard John the Baptist 
tell the Messiah was coming. So John tells them that, or when, when he was baptizing uh, in the Jordan River, John the Baptist actually did not know Jesus' uh, Jesus' identity. Never met him. But when he baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. Again, before this happened, it says in verse 31 in this chapter that John knew him not. He didn't realize he was baptized in the Messiah until the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. Can you imagine, can you only imagine how John the Baptist felt when this happened? He'd been preaching, preaching and teaching the Messiah was coming. And now he sees him. You know, when John sees Jesus, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God. You know, John the Baptist, what he was doing, he was taking the attention that he was getting off of him and on to Jesus. Something else that was unique where Jesus, Jesus was baptized, my book says that it's the same area that Elijah and Elisha parted the water. It's the same area. Also, this is the same area where Elijah was called up in a chariot of fire. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Two of the disciples heard what, what Jesus or what was said about Jesus and they began following Jesus. And Jesus, he invited them to stay with them. One of the two was Andrew, which was Simon Peter's brother. The other disciple is not mentioned by name, but people believe that it was John who was writing this gospel. It was him. John usually never referred to himself by name. He often called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Also in the book of Mark, it lists John as one of the early disciples to follow Jesus. So the other disciple, the, 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 so the disciples was probably Andrew and John. Anyway, we'll read uh, verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which he is being interpreted the Christ. One of the first things Andrew did after he began following Jesus was to go out and find his brother Simon to tell him about Jesus. You know, when he found Simon, he, he tells him, we have found the Messiah. You know, the Jews back then, they'd been looking for and waiting for the Messiah to come. The Jews knew that, that God had promised King David back in the Old Testament and other Old Testament prophecies that he would be sending a Messiah. The Jews' expect, the expectations for the Messiah, though, was they thought he would come, he'd come in and destroy their enemies, especially the Romans, so they wouldn't rule over them anymore. They had the wrong expectations for the Messiah. He'll be much more, much more than that, and something even greater than destroying their enemies. Jesus came to forgive and to offer eternal life. In verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt call Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. You know, Andrew brings his brother, his brother Simon to Jesus. And I'm sure on the way as they is walking there, Andrew is telling him all that he had learned about Jesus. I'm sure he was excited. He was excited telling Simon about the Lord. We also have an exciting message to tell. We also, we need to lead people. We need to lead people to Jesus, just like Andrew was leading his brother. Well, Jesus, of course, when he saw him, he knew who Simon was. He tells them that he was the son of Jonah. 
Jesus tells him that he would be known as Cephas, which means rock. In Greek, his name means Peter, which I can say better. <laughs> the name Simon was also, it was very common. That was a very common name back then. You know, one of the brothers of uh, Jesus' brothers was named Simon. Uh, the man that uh, helped Jesus carry the cross, his name was Simon. Many more people in the Bible in, uh, was named Simon. But no one in the New Testament was named Peter. Peter ended up being a rock, a rock for the gospel of Christ. He proclaimed the gospel and even ended up dying for the resurrection, resurrected Christ. You know, Jesus knew, Jesus knew what he was doing when he referred to him as a rock. In verse 43. The day, followed Jesus, or the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. You know, Jesus leaves to go to Galilee. Jesus went there with a purpose, which was to find Philip to be one of his disciples. Jesus, he already knew, he already knew who the 12 disciples were, were going to be. When he found Philip, Jesus tells him to follow him. Follow me. You know, Philip was the first one that was not led to Jesus by someone else. Jesus found him. And apparently he accepted Jesus' invitation because he was excited to tell others about Jesus. Verse 44 through uh, 46, now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see so Philip, he could not wait, could not wait to tell his friend Nathaniel about Jesus. You know, I got to thinking about the age that we're living in right now. We would have a hard time surviving like they did back then. You know, today, if we need to tell someone something, the only thing we have to do is pick up our cell phone and say, where you at? I need to tell you something. It's just that easy. Back then, they actually had to go and look and find them before they could tell them something. Sin has not changed, but technology sure has. You know, he finds Nathaniel and he tells him about Jesus. You know, he refers to Jesus as to what Moses and the prophets had written in the Old Testament. What he is saying is, is that Jesus is the one who is fulfilling the law of what the prophets had said about the coming Messiah. You know, Philip also referred to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel, he responds, is there any good that comes from out of Nazareth? You know, Nazareth back then, it was a, it was a small, insignificant village. It's not even mentioned in the Old Testament or other Jewish writings. It sure didn't say that the Messiah would be coming from there. So when Nathaniel, he was a little bit skept skeptical about what Philip was telling him. But Philip, he didn't argue. He didn't try to explain. He just tells Nathaniel, come and see. Philip knew, he knew that when, uh, when he uh, uh, would see Jesus, he, knew, he too would know Jesus, Jesus was the Messiah. In verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, 
in whom is no guile. You know, a lot of people will hesitate on telling someone about Jesus because they're afraid. They're afraid they won't agree with them or maybe just afraid they'll call you a nut, a religious nut or something. But this is not a good reason. It's not a good reason not to tell them about Jesus. You know, we, we need to trust. We need to trust God and let Him work on their hearts when we tell them about our Savior. You know, back in the Old Testament, Jacob, he was a deceiver. But God changed him. He changed his heart and his character. Then he changed his name to Israel. Now, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Jesus knew that Nathanael was like Israel and was a man of faith. You know, back then the Jews, they, they were content. They were content on just observing the Jewish laws and rituals. But Jesus knew that Nathanael's faith went a lot deeper than that. In verse 48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Behold, that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree. I saw thee. You know, Nathanael was a little surprised when Jesus said what he said about him. So Nathanael asked Jesus, Whence knowest uh, thou me? You know, what we would say today, uh, you would say, Have we met before? Or just how do you know so much about me? You know, in the Bible, you know, it's mentioned several times that Jesus could know what a person was thinking and also know what's in their heart. In the Old Testament, it says that God knew what a person was thinking and what's in their heart. This just proves Jesus' deity or divinity. You know, Jesus tells Nathaniel that, that he had seen him under a fig tree. Now, what is significant about sitting under a fig tree? You know, back then, a rabbi would find a fig tree and sit in the shade to study, to study the law and God's word. So with Jesus saying what he's, that, that he saw him under a fig tree, Jesus was saying that he knew, he knew Nathaniel was a dedicated student of the Word. Now this would have amazed or amazed Nathaniel, a man he had never met, but yet Jesus knew all about him. Right then, at that point, Nathaniel knew exactly who Jesus was. In verse 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. So Nathanael was skeptical at first when Philip was telling him about Jesus. If you remember, he said, could any good, any good come out of Nazareth? a village that was nothing. But Philip didn't give up. He told him, Philip told him, says, just come and see. You know, when we tell, when we tell someone that is lost about Jesus, it may not go, it may not go as we planned it to go. But we should never give up. Invite them to church or, or a church that they live close to. Tell them, come and see. Then we, we should put our faith, we should put our faith in God and let God go to work. God, He may end up using us again to talk to that person. We just need, we just need to put our faith, our faith in God and, and pray for the lost, that they may realize they're lost 
and that they need, they need Jesus. You know, when Nathaniel was standing before Jesus, you know, he realized who Jesus was. He said, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. You know, Nathaniel's life, it would never be the same after that. When a person realizes who Jesus is, their life will never be the same. So this month, this month, our lessons has, have been on love. We're to love our neighbor. Our neighbor is anyone that we may meet. We show our love and God's love to others by meeting their needs. We honor others and we're commanded to forgive others. But the greatest love that we can have for someone and show them that we love them is when they're lost, we tell them about Jesus. It's the greatest love we can ever show. Most important thing that anyone will ever, ever do in their life is accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Anyway, that's all I have. Anybody have anything else they'd like to mention on this list? Let's all get a roll in the hymnal this morning and turn together to hymn number 15. Hymn number 15. Let's stand and sing together. standing in a word of prayer and certainly welcome you to Bethany. It's good to be in the Lord's house, isn't it? Amen. And uh, I just thank God I'm able to be here this morning. Amen. And it's wonderful to be in the Lord's house. Trust the Lord's going to help us in a special way this morning. And we're praying for the service as it goes further. And already our opening and then our Sunday school, we thank the Lord for that. And it's been a blessing. Uh, we want to maybe take... Uh, a prayer request and maybe something on your heart for prayer. Appreciate the prayer. We had 30, 32 our Sunday school. And then the message this morning, I appreciate you praying for me. And I was telling Petey and he said, well, I was praying for you last night. You get it in your mind. I hope it's just the lingering effects of COVID. But uh, I, I get stuff I think in my mind and then it, it washes away pretty quick. But uh, it may be old age. You know, that's what they pin everything on. But uh, but the, Debbie said it is old lady. She's already diagnosed it. I'm gonna look I at your. Also. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can relate. But uh, Lord's got something on my heart. I pray it help me to deliver it. And I'm praying for Brian. I've been praying for him. 
and the Lord's going to touch him this morning and he's going to share it. And I want him to come. What's on his heart? Good to be in God's house, is it not, this morning? It is good to be in God's house. In the book of Psalms this morning, chapter number 40 and verse number 1, the Bible says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. And He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and He set my feet upon a rock, and He established my goings. And um, I want you to get a picture of this in your mind right quick this morning. David said that he, God inclined himself toward him. It's almost like he leaned down and he heard his cry. And it wasn't just that, though, David was excited about, though, but he said also that he pulled him up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, as he was stuck and sinking. So this morning, I know a guy. I know a guy that was doing some bush hogging, and he was trying to clean up some of the rough patches and stuff that, you know, this time of year that you kind of let go, you know, to it's, you just got to do them. And he decided he'd back in to a place there and he'd go ahead and get it, you know, bush hog down. Get out right quick, you know, before he possibly marred up in it. So as he made that turn to back out, his tractor set down. And the more he struggled and the more he tried to get it out, the deeper he got. So he had to give up on it Friday because it's getting dark. Had something he had to do Saturday morning, so on about 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon, he decided he's going to work on it again. He got to get this thing out. Took his backhoe down there. He dug around it trying to get a trench to try to drain some of the water out so maybe he could get the thing out. Got his dad to go down there with the other tractor, hooked to it, pull it. Wouldn't budge. Dug in that miry clay and had to keep jobbing blocks underneath that wheel to try to pull that thing out a little bit farther. And he's hooked to it and he pulled out a foot. He's excited. And then it's socked down again. Out come the shovel. Out come the digging. Out come throwing blocks under it. Here we go again. We make it two feet this time. Out come the shovel. Out come the box. Out come the digging. Go get the other tractor hooked to that tractor and let's pull this thing out, he said. So he got his son to take the other tractor and hook two tractors together. That ought to pull that thing out, shouldn't he? Started moving. This time, after you know, one of them blocks, it was doing good. I'm too, it was just like he was two foot away from where he could get out on solid ground. And he's excited. And now he prayed and asked the Lord Friday to give me wisdom and strength. Did I mention that? And then he sits there as he's, that last two feet, that tractor starts burying in the mud, literally. I mean being pulled forward and drugged down into the mud. Over the radiator almost. And he's trying to get him to stop. Hey, 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 stop, stop. You're pulling me. I can't stop. You're pulling me into the ground. And he sat there frustrated and aggravated. And he said, Lord, I give up. I've done everything I can do. And I can't get it out. you got to get it out. Had two blocks left. He had two blocks. That's all he had, just two. Out of all that wood he throwed in there, had two blocks left. Well, that ain't going to do it. This thing's buried plumb to the radiator. And he dug, and he put the two blocks in, and he sit there expecting to put a sign on it and say, for sale if you can get it out. <laughs> Let it sink to the middle earth. And he sat there thinking, maybe I got to get a big skid or something over here to get it pulled out. But did you did mention to you that he just prayed? And as them two tractors revved up, off they went, and that thing pulled out just like it was sitting on dry ground. And there it sat. Did I mention he'd prayed again? You got to wonder if he was really, really had the faith in what he was praying. But he should have, because who was he praying to? And who cares about you this morning? Everything you do, he cares about you this morning. He inclines his ear towards us. He hears my cry. Let's apply it spiritually right quick. We'll get out there in that miracle. We're going to go in just a little bit. Not much. Till we mar up. 
And there we sit, the harder we struggle in that sin and the harder we can try to get out. That we can see right over there, Chris, it's just a foot or so right over here. We can get out of this thing. And what are we going to do? We struggle and we go deeper. We got to give up. And we got to call upon Him. And we got to give it to Jesus. He's the only one that can pull us out of that miry pit. The only one. D.L. Moody said, if Peter's got up there, he said, when a man, let me paraphrase the first part. It, it, you, you know, prairie fire, and we don't have prairies around here, but there are a whole bunch of sea grass, right? It gets dry, and you'll get a prairie fire, and you'll see it coming. He said, a horse can't even outrun that fire. So what are you going to do standing there? Can you run 30 plus miles an hour? I don't think so. So what are you going to do? So I tell you what they'd do. They'd take a match, and they'd light the fire right there, or the grass right there where they's at, and they'd burn a spot. And they'd get in the center of that grass there where it was burnt. And that fire would come raging across that plain. But they stood right there in the center of that place that was already burnt. The fire can't touch what's already been passed over, you see. So what's the last part, Pete? He said, and here the flames roared and they came along, but uh, that they did not fear. They did not even tremble uh, as the ocean flames surged around them. For over the place where they stood, the fire had already passed and there is no danger. And there was one spot on this earth that God had swept over. And 1,900 years ago, the storm burst on Calvary and the Son of God took, in, uh, took on to his own bosom. And now if we take our stand by the open cross, we are safe for time and eternity. Praise God, no matter what's raging around us, we're standing right there in the middle of that spot. The fire can't touch you. Listen, Jesus saved you. Hell has no power upon you anymore. It's, it, Jesus did it all for us. It's what I'm trying to say this morning. Gary, I couldn't help this morning think. Got Marie's little girl. I can say that this morning too. When she talked about Leo, her papa, I can say this morning, ask me who's holding me. His name's Jesus. He's got me in his precious arms this morning. He owns not only the cattle that stand on the hills, but he owns the very hills that they're standing on. He owns all that this morning. But you know what the most important thing to me is? This morning, got any idea? He saved me. Thank God he did. He saved my soul. For all he's done, for all the people he's done it for, to me this morning, he saved me. There I stood in that miry pit. There I stood struggling. And he saved me. But you know what? Man, he'll do it for somebody else too. He just didn't do it for me. He didn't get judged sin on Calvary just for me, but he did it for all. Why can't we this morning? Why can't people as lost see their need of Jesus this morning? Why? Flames can't touch that which has already passed over this morning. All right, y'all have had enough, ain't you? I don't know that fellow. He wasn't very smart and got that tracker stuck, was he? I'm glad I don't know who that was. Anybody got prayer requests this morning? Children's Church. Church, Bible school, Bible school. Yeah, preacher, pastor, right here. Yeah, been a lot mentioned this morning. A lot of seems like sad stuff this morning, but praise God, we're in God's house this morning, and Jesus can move upon our hearts this very day. You ready to pray? Let's pray this morning, Father. We do come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, what's humble and gratefulness of heart, Lord, this morning that we know you, but more importantly, God, you know us this morning. And I pray, Father, that you might look, look upon each and every one of our hearts this morning. And Lord, if there be things there that shouldn't be there, God, would we lay them upon that altar this morning? Would we stand in the place of safety that is Jesus this morning? I pray, Lord, that the message of Jesus might be proclaimed throughout this world. But God, that it might be heard and Lord, it might be, your, your free gift might be received. Saving grace that you so generously and so lovingly, God, offered us. Would it be accepted today? I pray for this church. I pray for a pastor. We pray for children's church. We pray for Bible school. We pray for the many needs this morning. But Lord, this morning we pray if somebody's lost, Lord, today, would this might be the very day they come to know you as their personal Savior. And Father, I thank you for hearing my prayers. I thank you, Lord, for caring for me and doing those things, Lord, that may seem small to us, but Father, 
we thank you, God, that you're doing for us anyway. We're going to pray and ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. sing together hymn number 97. There shall be showers of places this morning. We're in the book of Colossians and also in the book of Ephesians, just one verse each place. I'm trying to preach this morning on your identity in Christ. I trust the Lord helps in the message. And I want to mention this also. Preacher Jimmy had asked me uh, to mention this for prayer. And uh, he, of course, his ministry through the years, he's, uh, he's ministered there to uh, uh, to the reservation there uh, with the Indian people and then also in, the, in the, the other areas there, the Devil's Lakes where he's located. And But he's done a lot of work on the reservation. He told me that, uh, and it just happened on yesterday, uh, the, uh, well, the, it happened a little before yesterday, but yesterday was a, was a, was a sad day. And there was a little boy. He said he used to bring to church uh, several years ago. And he grew up and uh, he's got a little girl. Had a little girl three years old. Just three years old. And uh, I don't know all the situation. Don't know if Preacher Jimmy did or not. But uh, drugs was involved. And the, and the dad of a little three-year-old girl, uh, perhaps drugs himself, but he had put some drugs in uh, either her bottle or sippy cup and she had drank it, and uh, they rushed to the hospital, and they uh, pronounced her brain dead. And he said yesterday, about 5 o'clock, they had unplugged the life support. And so he asked you to pray for that situation. And uh, he was uh, you know, very touched by it, of course. And you know, I was thinking about the verse in the Bible, that evil men shall wax worse and worse. And some of the evil, horrendous things that we see happening in our day is... Uh, is very touching and to, to be thought and take note of 
And you say, what do you think of missed all that? And he said yesterday, Preacher Jim, I believe the same thing. Lord's soon coming. Amen. And uh, we're in that, we've heard that. And you, you read that in the Bible. There, the scoffers come the last days. So we've heard that for years and years and years. Well, uh, I believe we've seen some things in our day that we've not seen before. Uh, the COVID situation, we've seen a falling away that, that I did not see in my early ministry. I've seen people out of, drop out of church, but in the, in the, in the degree to what it is now. And uh, we're seeing that. You say, what do the Bible talk about it, that? It sure does. And you say, what do you think? I believe the time's near. And I, I, I pray you just, uh, I, I pray the Lord to help me this morning. And it is uh, kind of bothersome to me to, you know, whenever you, you, your mind slips of things and, and, you know, even around the house and different things. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, and, and, and uh, David's diagnosed it for me, but I'm very forgetful, seem like. And, but I, I trust the Lord help me with the message. I believe, I believe the message this morning. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something here in just a little bit. But I won't, I won't just uh, give a, a few things uh, at the outset of the message. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I was reading about a Christian counselor. And he talked about defeated Christians. And uh, well, if you'll just give me that, Petey, while I'm talking about that, uh, what I had written there about that. And uh, he, he talked about one thing in common. And I'm trying to preach this morning on, uh, and the, the, uh, as a believer, thank God you're no longer in Adam, but praise God, we're in Christ. And I want to emphasize that. And I want to say the message this morning. I believe the message this morning, and I, tr I trust you'll listen. Uh, I, believe it, I believe it is the motivation uh, for, uh, for what we need to consider this morning of moving closer to the Lord. And I pray the Lord will help us with that. Our identity in Christ. Uh, but, uh, and he said, every, uh, this, this was through the lens of one person, but I'd say if you probably did a survey of a lot of Christian counseling, you'd probably find the same thing. He said, every defeated Christian I've worked with has one thing in common. Uh, none of them knew that they were in Christ. They understood what it meant to be a child of God. They lost grip on that if they ever had it before. And that's what I'm trying to talk about this morning is our identity in Christ. And leave that up there just a minute. I want, this is kind of the thing I want to say in relation to that is that in, in saying that, reading that, it may be that uh, maybe no one here and perhaps no one would fit in that category. He said, well, I, I'm in church this morning and I'm trying to seek the Lord. I don't consider myself a defeated Christian. And, and perhaps that's true for each and every one, perhaps. But I want to say this in relation to the message is that somebody just a little while back said to me and said, Preacher, I said, you know that uh, we're as close to the Lord as we choose to be. And he went on and said to me, said, you know, we know as much as the Bible as we choose to learn. You know, there's a verse in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which says, Study, show yourself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I was reading, the last thing I read last night, and sometimes I'll, uh, before I turn the light out, I prop myself up on the pillow, and I usually read something in closing, and I picked up the devotional there I had, and, uh, and on the devotional for that particular day was, uh, it said, approved of God. That was the, was the caption, and it used that verse and related to that, being approved of God. Studies show yourself approved unto God. And you say, well, how did that, uh, in, in considering that, what had been said to me, and, I, and that could be a blanket coverage for all of us, but I took that to heart myself. I, you know, I believe a lot of times the Lord has given us a message, maybe through different people as they speak to us, and I thought about that very seriously. Our choices, our choices uh, determines uh, the outcome. And what we choose, you know, you hear sometimes people get in a lot of trouble and everything, and we'll use that term. I've heard that used a whole lot, said, well, they made bad choices. But for the Christian, you know, our choices. I was thinking about in relation to this, and I'm, I believe the message when we get into it, our identity in Christ is a motivation for every one of us to move up closer to the Lord. 
And you say, well, I, I, certainly you've already said that and you've excused all of us as a dedicated Christian. But I might say this, uh, what about our, our, our zeal, our, our interest that we one time had? Uh, you know, I might ask this question, are we as close as the Lord as we have been in the past? You know, it's something to consider. I hope we'll consider that this morning. And I was thinking in preparing this of a lady several years ago. She was a Christian, but she had gotten out of church. And I was talking to her there that day, and she said this to me. And uh, it's a saying that I'd heard before, but she said this to me. She said that day, she said, you know, Roger said, it's nobody's fault but me, myself, and I. Anybody ever heard that besides me? Me, myself, and I. And you know, whenever you get to that point, then usually you're going to do something. And you know, I was thinking in the message that bore my heart that until a person sees a need, there's no improvement and there's no choices to do better. And it's the same way with salvation. We emphasize that in Bible school. A person, I don't believe nobody ever got saved according to the scriptures and all until they realize they're a sinner and they realize a need uh, to be saved, the need. And the need for the Christian must be there. But she said that to me that day. She said, you know, uh, being out of church, she said, it's nobody's fault, Roger, but just me, myself, and I. But you know what? It was not very long at all. She didn't come to our church, but she went to another church, a good church. She was back in church. She got down to the point where me, myself, and I, you know, the old thing, human nature is whenever we do something wrong or we're failing to do something we ought to be doing, it's always you blame it on somebody else. And then if I can't get nobody else to hang it on, then I figure some way to justify what I've done. That's the pattern that you follow in sinful nature. That's sinful nature's pattern. But whenever you come down to just, it ain't nobody's fault but me, myself, and I then I'll just about guarantee it every time business will pick up. So I'm encouraging this morning. You say, well, I want you to listen, take it to heart. And you say, well, what uh, it could be in my life in moving forward in the Lord? I'd say there'd be some movement that all of us could make this morning. And I really believe that. And the Lord would help us. Amen. And I trust you'll help me. And I won't just let loose. I hope the Lord will let me let loose and, I'll, I'll, and bring to mind, you know, what it's just been unusual. I'll get it and study it and write it down. And then sometimes I, and I tried to reflect some in my mind last night at trying before I went to sleep. And so I just, I, there wasn't nothing coming back much. And I just picked up the devotional and started reading. I said, well, I'll read something that'll just help me. And it helped me. Approved of God. So I'll look at the message and trust the Lord will help us this morning as we look and consider it. And it's just uh, something I pray the Lord will use and help. Uh, we see in, in my first little outline, I believe, Pete, that I've got. And uh, I, I want to get that about uh, when you read a verse. and uh, to, Right. Uh, when we find in the Bible a promise, we ought to claim it. Amen. We have every right to claim it. I thank God for that, don't you? Now, I thought about some of these TV fellows and they were off track with that. They command God to do this, that, and other. But if I'm reading it right, preacher, that we're on the obeying end and God's on the commanding end. And our end of it is the obedience, amen. And he's the Savior and we're the sinner, amen. We get in the right perspective. But we can claim a promise when we see it in the Bible and thank God for that. And we'll do that every time. And then whenever we see a command, we ought to obey it. And whenever we see a truth, Praise God, we ought to believe it. Amen. And that got on my heart. I was thinking about that when we're looking in the scriptures. And I want to look this morning at my little outline is uh, my next thing there is uh, that you're accepted and secure and significant. Our identity with the Lord. And as I read that and studied it, and I've got two sides of paper back there and I give it to Pete and then I've got what, uh, 25 or 30 verses scriptures I've looked up <laughs> had all that and, and uh, but I trust the Lord help me but as I studied that it motivated me and I believe it's a motivation and there's a verse I believe that captures what I'm trying to say this morning is that we love him why because he first loved us that's the motivation you know we have people I believe that persons eternally saved when they're born again they're born into the family of God 
And you can't be unborn, praise God, you're headed for heaven. And I thank God for that. I rejoice in that. And by saying that, you know, we're accused. And I've heard that before and people say that. They say, well, if you believe that, then you give a person a license to sin. The old time preachers, they had it. They had it right. They had it right. That believes that. It's not a license to sin. Whenever you realize your identity in Christ and you realize you're accepted and secure and you're significant, praise God, it'll be a motivation to live right and not a motivation to sin. Amen. An old time preachers, you say this, I've heard them come to our church and they'd say, I drink all the liquor I want to drink. And you know, some of us blur eyes. And they said, the truth of it is, I don't want to drink any because God has changed my want to. Amen. <laughs> my want to. And I do a lot of other things, all that I want to do, but I've got a different want to, amen, and I've got a different desire. And the reason being, praise God, he lifted us out of the mire, amen. And I like that, burn around him and nothing could touch him. Give me the verse, and I thought about the verse, of what is First John 5, 18, is that the verse where it said that wicked one can't touch us? And I said, praise God, you little bride that's given us that and excited me and said, you burn that out. We know that what, whosoever is born of God sinneth not for, and, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not, praise God. I thought about that verse when he is talking about, you know, he cleared out the place and they couldn't touch him. That clearing out the place, I thought about uh, uh, Talbert Moore. He's an old time fundamental preacher, we call it, believe the Bible, you know, and just, and, and we was talking in the Sunday school class, somebody talking about praising God, and it don't scare me none, amen, praise God for that. But he said that he was in a, uh, he was in a meeting, they was having a special meeting, and, and they had a group of preachers gathered together, and, and they were concerned about uh, maybe some liberal preacher getting in the group and so forth. And he said they went around, everybody talking and planning the meeting. We want to keep it, you know, biblical and we want to stay with God and all that. And we don't want nothing to intermingle that's going to confuse things and all that. And he said he was sitting there listening to all of it. And said, finally, the moderator said to him, said, Brother Moore, you've not said anything yet. And said, we value your opinion. Now, what do you think about it? And he said, well, I don't have no problem with liberals myself. And they said, you don't. He said, no, whenever one gets around me, he said, I just clear out a place and start praising God. And so they head for the hills. Amen. <laughs> you get hot enough and they'll move on. Amen. Uh, thank God for that. I praise the Lord for that. Amen. You know, they can duplicate maybe our singing and our praising and all that. But here's one thing that th those that don't have it, they can't duplicate the fire. Right. And so I want to look this morning. I'm thinking our identity in Christ. Praise God what we have in Christ. You know, I've said this before and I still believe that. Once you get saved and trust the Lord. And, you know, we, many of us, I say we, many of us, and not everyone, but many of us who grew up in church and so forth, we knew a lot of Bible stories and a lot of other things before we ever got saved. But there are those that never, they wouldn't know John 3, 16. You know, there have been those that have been witness to and said, you know, I want to show you something out of the Bible. And they said, what's that? A Bible. They don't know what a Bible is. But you know, whenever they get saved, but whenever you get saved and trust Christ, even if you've been in church and learned a whole lot, then the rest of your Christian life, you're learning about what all He did for you. And you say, how long are you going to learn about what all He did for you, preacher? As long as I'm alive and can think and still study, I'm going to learn about what He did for me. Amen. And I'll talk this morning about some of the things, praise God, that He did for me. He did for me. I don't look this morning. I'm thinking on uh, first number one, I am accepted. Praise God, I'm accepted. In the book of Ephesians, give us a verse, and I ain't even read my text verse this morning. In our memory verse is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, thank God for that, don't you? Not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And our two verses we're reading this morning, book of Ephesians, my, my text verses, to the praise and glory of His grace, wherein He has made us accepted in the beloved. And then in the book of Colossians this morning, He said, and you're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank You for salvation. Thank You for saving me. 
And I pray, Lord, you'd bring to mind and heart an arm of flesh of me. And my mind will slip up. Lord, you're, you're controlling things this morning. And it's already been said to me before I got up here. said it's a place where no man stands alone. And Lord, I'm praying you'll help me. In my own, in my own flesh, my own thinking, uh, I couldn't think of nothing hardly. But Lord, I pray you'd help me. And I pray the message would go forth and he'd, he'd just do something in our hearts and in our lives. And I pray you'd help us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, look, this morning I'm thinking about, number one, I am accepted. We used to have a little song sung with the kids when I was at Maranatha, I believe. And Hannah may remember it. But we sung a little song. We'd sing it too. And the little song said, I am special, I am special. If you look, you will see someone Jesus died for, someone Jesus died for. Yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. I am special, amen. That's my third point this morning. We're significant, thank God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, our identity in Christ. And what He's done for me is a motivation for me, amen, to want to learn more, to want to pray more, to want to serve God, and to want to get closer to Him, amen. And I don't just, I, I trust the Lord to help me. Michaela's a runner. She's run all through these hills up here and wherever and whatever, and they talk about the second wind. And maybe God will give me that this morning. And as I'm finishing up, but I think every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, it, it bears on my mind more, more and more, that I want to thank God I'm able to be here this morning. And I thank God that I have what thinking capacity I have. And I want to thank God for that. That's one of the things within our family. My younger brother told me, my sister Betty talking to me, and, and David also, and all four of you. Know, my mother had Alzheimer's. And my younger brother said, that's one thing that I just trust that I'll never, I hope I don't get that. But we don't know what the Lord has for us, do we? But God's good, amen, wherever it goes, amen. And, and I'm going to end up, and if you're saved, you're going to end up on the street of gold, amen. And it'll be worth it all when we get home, won't it? We sing the song, I remember growing up, heaven, heaven will surely be worth it all, amen. And we rejoiced in that. You, I can rejoice in that this morning. I'm accepted, praise God. I'm God's child. First uh, book of John chapter 1, verse 12. But to as many as receive him to them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I'm God's child. Then in the book of John, chapter 15, praise God, I'm glad I'm, God's, I'm, I'm Jesus' friend. Amen. We sing the song. I love that song, don't you? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything, everything to him in prayer. Ain't that a blessing? And then it goes on, the songwriter said, and sometimes with our neglect, it said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. And why do we do that? The songwriter went on and said, because we do not take everything to him in prayer. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes, and I like what Brian's talking about, praying and, and the, so on, that's a good thing to do before or after. But I've, uh, sometimes my failure is, you know, we try whatever we can do and so on. And then when, when we see that it ain't going to work and we ain't going to never get it to work, then we pray. But, you know, at the very outset, the best thing, you know, I've got a little book. It took me about 15 minutes to read it. And his, I, I got to hear the fellow preach that wrote it. And he, he, he come about, his wife had a terminal illness. She passed away. And he said in his prayer closet, God began to dwell with his heart. And he, and, he, and he got a new look and a new hold and a new grasp on prayer. And he wrote the little book, Prayer First. No matter what endeavor we're doing, the best route to take, praise God, is take it to the Lord in prayer right on the very beginning. Little things, big things, whatever it is. Amen. Take it to Him in prayer. I'm glad, thank God, that I'm Christ's friend. And then I've been justified. The book of Romans 5, verse 1. Just, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm accepted, praise God. I've been bought with a price. One of our memory verses, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. I mean, we've been bought for Christ. My identity in Christ, number one, I'm accepted. I'm a member of Christ's body, thank God. I'm, in the, I'm a saint. I'm accepted as God's child, and I have access. I've been redeemed. Thank God I've been forgiven, and I am complete in Christ. My identity in Christ is a motivation for me to want to move up closer to Him and want to love Him more. And I love Him, thank God, because He first loved me. What a blessing. 
good to be in the Lord's house, ain't it? You know, I was thinking about that. When we find a command, well, to obey it. You say, what's happened, preacher? Well, we that have assembled this morning have obeyed one of the commands that's in the Bible. Hebrews 10, 25, forsaking not the assembling of yourself together as a manner of some is. Praise God. In the Lord's house. And you can't preach to them that are not there. But I'm a little puzzled with people with the COVID situation that can go each and everywhere and work every day and take vacations and go everywhere that there is in the whole world except church. Have you figured that out yet? Ain't that a puzzle? I mean, church is the only exemption. We're going to cut church out. Anyway, I need to get back on the bed. I just wanted to say that. It made me feel good to say it. It's all my burning on my heart. Amen. You know, I believe if you're able, I believe if you can work every day somewhere, you know, 40 hours a week, and you can go on vacation and go whatever and do whatever you want to, if you're saved and profess to be saved, you could probably be on the church pew. Amen. And hear the preacher and pray for the preacher and love the preacher. Amen. <laughs> and not even have a bad thought about the preacher. <laughs> I mean, if you do, run for repentance and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I thought bad about him. Then not only that, what's my second point, Petey? <laughs> I've done lost my place. I'm secure, thank God. Ain't that a blessing to know that you're secure? I'm talking about my identity in Christ. And Brian brought that out in Children's Church. Praise God, they burned a place around him. And D.L. Moody said those that were standing there, they were as secure as they could be, weren't they? I'm free from condemnation. One of our memory verses, John 5, 24, it said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever heareth my word, believe on him that sent me, have everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, because you cause his past from death unto life. Praise God, I want to thank God this morning that I'm not under condemnation. Then not only is that, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I like that, don't you? We had memory verses when I first came here, I believe, and had a bunch of them accumulated, a whole bunch. In fact, uh, Luke 18, 1, and he spake unto them again another parable, and to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And that was Brother Kenneth Taylor's memory verse. And he put some action to that. He worked down there for uh, Twin City Paving, and it was Carl Rose, and he started a morning prayer down there. Kenneth always went early. That was different for me. I always, I'm dragging up the river, but he's always went early wherever he went. And so he started a prayer meeting. And God touched that. I preached it in Georgia, Georgia and I mentioned that about Brother Tim starting a prayer meeting. Had a young fellow come up after service and said, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. I'm going to go on my job and try to do the same thing. And I thought about how wide maybe that spread, you know, memory verse. But there's somebody else here in the church remembered the book of Romans, you know. And had all those life verses there and had them all memorized. What a blessing. And it says there as you read those and get excited about from about verse 35 on down, said there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. I'm glad, thank God, that I'm secure. I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. And I've got eternal life. John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they'll never perish. I'm secure, thank God. I'm accepted in Him. I'm secure in Him. And then I've, our memory verse, He's given us not the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And praise God, I'm sealed into the day of redemption. And book of Ephesians 3 and 20, I'm a citizen of heaven. Amen. <laughs> I'm a citizen of heaven. Oh, what a blessing. My name is written there. Ain't that a blessing? We've got a citizenship. We're citizens of two countries this morning. And one of them's everlasting. We got, we're looking for a kingdom of which there is no end, thank God. And then we can receive mercy and truth and grace in the time of need. Book of Hebrews. We can boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, the songwriter got it right, said, just the time I need him, he's always there. Hey. You ever notice that? Now, I'll be honest, I've thought a few times he is going to be late, but he wasn't. Just the time I need him, he's always there. What a blessing. And then I am significant. I am significant. I'm in Christ. I looked that word up and it said, uh, worthy to be noted. 
significant. I'm special. I'm special. If you look, you'll see I'm someone that Jesus died for. Yes, that's me. I'm significant. You say, what are you? I'm salt and light. We that are saved with the salt of the earth, with the light of the world. Praise God, I'm a branch. Thank God that's hooked in the true vine. John chapter 15. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then praise God, He allows us, and it's by abiding in the vine as a branch, we can bear fruit, thank God, to the glory of God. I'm a, my identity in Christ is a motivation for me. Amen, a motivation. Whenever I'm too lazy and I need a little push and motivation, this right here is helping me this morning. Amen. And when I do other things and it's not always easy to dig in and study and pray and other things that we know we ought to be doing, this is the motivation. And I'll tell you another thing that motivates you. Do like my friend, the lady I talked about, whenever you begin to get down and look at your life, is just repeat that. Look in the mirror and repeat that. Said it's me, myself, and I. It ain't even my wife that's my problem. It's me. Amen. And then we're, we're a personal witness for Christ. Acts 1.8. If you receive power, you'll be witnesses unto me. And our teacher brought that out in a lesson. You know, we're a personal witness for Jesus Christ. We're significant. Amen. Who's going to win a lost world? Who's going to influence uh, this nation in a Christian direct? It's you and I that are saved. Amen. God's hand, God's hand is upon the righteous. Amen. For the righteous is saved. Whenever Joseph got in Potiphar's house, the Lord blessed the house because Joseph was there. You say, are you significant? Yeah. I mean, goodness and mercy is just all around me this morning. <laughs> Why? Because of Jesus. Amen. And I love him because he first loved me. And this ought to promote us to praise him. Amen. Thank God. And in my, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ain't that special? That makes me pretty significant, don't it? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? Our body. And then we've got the ministry of reconciliation, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then we're God's co-worker. Ain't that a blessing? God's co-worker. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. We're labors together with Him. Co-worker. And then the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, we're God's workmanship. Ain't that a blessing? You know, it's exciting, isn't it, that he would take time to cooperate with us <laughs> and work with us. Amen. And that reassures me this morning. We're, we're co-worker with him. We've got a great partner, ain't we? And the reason I know that this, you know, I had, a, I had a fellow tell me one day, and he said, preacher said, sometimes I just stop and I ask myself the question, is, is this the real deal or not? Thank God I'm assured this morning it's the real deal. And you say, why do you think that? God's work is because it's went on all these many years, and I consider this who he's had to work with. It's had to be God's work. Amen. You know, you ever think the Lord looked maybe at me sometime and said, boy, you just can't find no good work, good help these days, can you? He's probably looked at me and thought that. But I won't thank God he didn't give me no pink slip. He just began to convict my heart and he brought me to the place where I said, it's me, myself, and I is the problem. And I want you to forgive me and help me. And then praise God, he, and the joy bells of heaven get to ringing in my soul again and the honeybees get to buzzing. Ain't that a blessing? I believe it might have been D.L. Moody. He used to ride trains. And it may have been another preacher. But he had, in his course of travel, ever who it was, He'd spoke harsh to someone there, maybe the conductor or somebody else, and you know, sometimes on a hot day and sweaty. You ever notice we get more agitated when it gets 90 some past that? Mm -hmm. Most Baptists, you don't want to be around them after 90. <laughs> but he's spoken harsh to maybe the ticket lady. 
And he said that he walked away and he said that the birds quit singing and the honeybees weren't buzzing around in his soul. And so he stopped where he was and walked back and he told the ticket lady, he said, I'm a Christian and I want to ask you to forgive me for speaking harshly and rudely to you. And he said he turned and walked away that day and the birds started singing again and the honeybees started buzzing in his soul. Amen. I'm glad to work every time, aren't you? Let's stand this morning and pray. If you don't know Jesus, I'm going to ask you to trust Him. Our identity in Christ, our identity in Christ. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank You. Thank You for salvation through the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I want to thank You for helping me. The arm of flesh will fail us every time. And Lord, You know my need more than I know myself. I pray you just be with us this morning as we give the invitation. If there's someone don't know Jesus, I pray they'd trust Him for salvation. They'd just step out from where they are and find their way down here to old-fashioned altar of prayer. And Lord, we do our best to pray for them, to guide them, to help them from the Word of God, how they can be saved, know the head for heaven. And I pray you'd move just to have your way in our hearts and lives. And Lord, I pray you'd, you would be motivated because of our identity in Christ. And truly every one of us that are saved can truly say, we love you because you first loved us. And thank you, Lord. I want to pray that, Lord, there's a lot of needs this morning been mentioned. Needs in our church family, people that are sick and need help. Just a lot of needs. Lord, I want to pray for each and every one of them. And then we just say a special word of prayer for the Marlowe family, his dear wife and those young children. And then the parents on either side, Lord, they're all just devastated. And I pray you'd help them. I pray for Preacher Donnie, the other preachers, Lord, that have a close relationship, did with Preacher Ryan. Pray you'd help them. Pray you'd help us again. We need you to move. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. You know, it's a fact this morning that the greatest single thing that any person on the face of the earth could know would be that right there. Amen. The greatest thing that we can know, amen, is that our name is written there. We're headed home, amen. <laughs> We're pulling out, aren't we? Amen. I thank God for that. I thank the Lord for that. And I praise the Lord for helping me. <laughs> God's good, ain't he? You know, we talk about Charles Spurgeon quite a bit and quote him, but I was thinking one thing that I'd read about him and was true of him. He had some very physical situations, ailments. And there was times during the week where it was just, you know, back and forth, whether he would know whether he was going to be able to fill that pulpit on Sunday morning or not. But God's good, ain't he? And I want to thank him for helping me. Amen. Thank him for helping me. And I was depending pretty much on my notes. I, the first church I ever pastored had one of the deacons, and I love him in the Lord. And somebody told me, said, you can't get along with him. <laughs> well, God just needed us two together, and he's just about as stubborn and crude as anybody you ever met in the whole world. But he is a blessing. And I had my Bible, you know, and had, I used to write my notes on a uh, line notebook paper and I'd put them in my Bible and I was looking and whatever. And so he, he, didn't, he didn't cotton to those notes too good. So he didn't know about me. So they scheduled a cottage prayer meeting. And I didn't have nowhere to put my Bible nor my notes either one. And the Lord helped me and I just cut loose and preached. And he said, that boy's all right. <laughs> I reflect back on that. What a blessing. God's good. We're going to pray. Darren, how about praying for us?